Hello everyone, I'm Dave Meinhard. I'm with the Vatikuti Foundation in suburban Detroit, and I want to thank you for joining us today. We have an interesting program on personalized medicine in the future of genetic testing in cancer. And cancer touches so many lives, including my own in many different ways, family members and others. And it's going to be nice to learn more about what is being developed now to help treat cancer, maybe discover it earlier. I'm going to learn a lot, I think, from, from our keynote speaker, Dr. Dahia. But I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Mahendra Bandari, who's the CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation, and he's going to be moderating this program today. So, Dr. Bandari, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave Meenhard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dahia. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to this forum of Vatikuti Foundation. Uh, you accepted despite your extremely busy schedule in your research lab and also a little odd time for West Coast. So thank you very much. Uh, a few things about Vatikuti Foundation. Vatikuti Foundation is a philanthropic organization mainly involved with uh, uh, working on incubators to bring in cutting edge technology to people. We are involved in the process of co-creation. Um, as you would know that technology per se has no role until somebody makes it applicable for human benefit. And of late, we have started patient education program, and this webinar is under the aegis of Vatikuti Foundation to educate patients. And we bring in interesting speakers for this program. Now, a little bit I would like to say about Dr. Daya and my acquaintances with him, and also about the subject. Let me first say about the subject. This is, friend, this is an era of designer thing, designer thinking, designer clothes, everything designer, because that is man-made. We don't want to do anything which everybody does. And that's why we think. But personalized medicine is totally different. I have practiced uh, high-end uh, academic surgery for almost 50 years, and I'm continuing, and I can tell you, uh, medicine is shots in the dark. However accurate we may be, but only when we know the response, there is always the if. I may do a wonderful operation, but ultimate test is how the patient is going to respond to my action. And similarly about medicine, we work on evidence-based uh, medicine and that is uh, uh, what you call the relational databases with very poor predictability. It is a generic thing. 50,000 patients uh, data, you may have a high level of evidence in terms of randomized control trials, which are never 100%, but there are some people who are always left with an answer to be given that what is going to happen. Today, nobody is interested in what happens to the rest of the world or 90% of the people. If I operate upon somebody with 99% results, which are good for a patient, for that one patient, I am the worst surgeon. He wants to know what is going to happen. And that is what is Dr. Daya is going to tell us. Uh, this is a buzzword. Everybody knows what is personalized medicine. I have some questions to add. I'm sure Dr. Daya would be covering, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I would like to add at this point so that he can really take a note and clarify my uh, doubts about this. I am totally aware of having worked in the lab about the genomic uh, accuracy and uh, what you guys do and how you are able to find the mutant strains or proteins or how you are able to assign it to a disease. You are able to do the gene corrections and things like that. That's all a good science. But here, 
for our viewers, I would like you to tell some concrete example how a common man is going to be benefited. Theoretically, it is understood that uh, uh, rather than choosing a chemotherapy agent from five, you are able to tell this is what is likely to work for your kind of mutation. That makes a perfect sense to me. But how exactly it works? And second question I have, the cancer patients always are surviving, they and their families are surviving moment to moment in anxiety. And these people are given that, okay, we have given this chemotherapy cycle, wait for six weeks or six months, and then we'll do patch CT to see what is the stage of, and that becomes like a competitive exam. They are so anxious, I deal with the patient, that what would be the outcome? As a molecular biologist of your status, I would like you to say what the patient can in dream monitor his disease rather than just hearing from them that chemotherapy had a partial response or a complete response. Now, about Dr. Daya, I don't claim to know him very well, but I know him very well. And first time when I met him, in fact, I know he's both the mentors. When he started with Dr. Emil Tenego, he was the urologist researcher, and even now his work is alive. And uh, I remember in one of the AUA meetings, because he happened to be a PhD from Chandigarh and uh, worked with Nirmal Ganguly, who is a great friend of mine. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think these are the top researchers and then he has a long career and his CV is worth seeing 400 plus papers. I don't know whether he has completed century or 99 funded grants from extramural agencies. And now he has, uh, he's very excited about the product which he's talking. So without much ado and being between you and Dr. Daya, thanking him once again, I will hand over to Dr. Daya, Rajveer Daya. Please, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bandari, this for your kind invitation and very glorifying introduction. Uh, first of all, I must say that I am highly grateful and impressed with the Vatikuti Foundation, which is serving the medical community and patients all over the world for the last 24 years. We are very proud of the founders, Raj and Padma. And Raj and Padma created this foundation about all these years, 25 years ago, and must have spent more than 100 plus millions of dollars this is absolutely remarkable, amazing service with passion, with empathy, sympathy, and dedication for humanity. Great job, proud of you, Raz and Padmana. So let me come back to my research topic. As Dr. Bhandari mentioned about, I'm going to talk about personalized medicine. And I will address both the questions raised by Dr. Bandari. Now, this field of personalized medicine is very exciting. And Dr. Bandari very well said that if I treat 99 patients correct, and one patient has a problem in recovering surgery or whatnot, so I'm not a good doctor for that one patient. So how can we make it 100% perfect? Dr. Bhandari has already introduced me. I did my PhD from external medicine, came to University of Chicago for fellowship, and then at UCSF for the last 38 years. This is my team, Dr. Ellen Northrup, Sean Givens and Graham McNeil. So the word personalized medicine was introduced in uh, 2000. So what does this mean? This means that when a healthcare delivery is tailored to a individual patient, 
and that is based on their genetic makeup, uh, their gene biomarkers, environment, and whatnot. So this is very, very exciting. Until 2011, NIH changed the name from the personalized medicine to precision medicine. So precision medicine is based on how the tumor of that person is characterized. I'll give example, if you have a 10 patient and all 10 patient, some of them will have a different gene profile in terms of their genetics. So out of 10, two may have mutations, two may have deletion, two may have amplification, two may have DNA methylation. So this means we are grouping patient based on their gene profiling. Then in 2015, our past president, Barack Obama, gave a very high priority to this project, call it a um, national high priority. And then there we are again start saying that one drug doesn't fit all. So therefore we should tailor every single tumors and treat them accordingly. So as I mentioned earlier, we divide the patient based on their susceptibility of a disease based on the biology, the prognosis, based on response. And then based on those characters, we start treating those patients. This field is very, very new. And this is just a starting. I'll give example. First trial started in 2018, which is like two years ago. So it's evolving field and it's very exciting. And I'll tell you how a common man or a person will be benefit from that. Because we are looking into each person's tumor using a lot of high-tech methods. I'll give example, we look at genomic, proteomic, transcriptome, epigenome, metabolome. This means that we look at the gene, the protein, the DNA methylation, the environment, the microbes, the metabolism. Whatever you have in the body, we look all of those things in each patient. And the term, the term precision has a different name. For cancer, we call it precision oncology. In psychiatry, we call it precision psychiatry. So this way we are using the precision medicine in every disease, not only in cancer. So some of you are patient, as Dr. Pandari said, and let me give a little background to them. Since the word of genome will be used quite often in this talk, so what is a gene? Gene is a basic building block of life. This is a basic unit in human body and made up of DNA. And based on the human genome project, we have 25,000 protein coding genes. And so these DNA, they cord around a protein called histone in the nucleus called chromosomes. So all these DNA and genes are basically on the chromosomes. Chromosome has small arm, big arm, that's how it looks like. And we all have 22 pairs of chromosomes are in every single human being. 23rd is different, XX or XY. Let me go back into this precision medicine again. So in 2016, after President Obama declared precision medicine is a high priority area, so everyone started working on it. So in 2016, we started analyzing genomic data of every single cancer we had. And then, so we, what do we look into that genomic data? We look at mutation, we look at deletion, 
rearrangement, translocation, polymorphism, gene fusion, gene amplification, DNA methylation. These are all genomic techniques to look at how these genes are being changed, altered, mutated, what not. So that was the first thing. So for a common person, if a person has got a mutation, so now United States government is starting a lot of trials and what they're doing is they are looking into what drug can inhibit or target that mutation containing cells. So this means you are, if a patient day has got a BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2, they are the name of the gene or P53 or KRAS, what not. So if you carry a KRAS mutation and we have developed a drug, so that drug is good for you. So this means your cancer has that mutation and they already develop a drug. So that drug will target that mutation which is present in your cancer. So that cancer will be killed by the drug. So this is how a common man will be benefited. Same thing, if you have a DNA methylation or deletion or rearrangement, translocation, polymorphism, gene fusion, so all amplification, all, all of those things will be used as a developing drug system. So that's how a lot of new drugs are coming up. And each drug is target to each type of gene alteration system. So you can imagine that a common man will be greatly benefited from this. This is early stage, may take some time, but it's a great hope. In 2017, they start a trial called MATCH trial. Means mean molecular analysis of therapy choice. Same thing. First, you look at the gene profiling and then start the treatment. So real precision medicine started in 2018 where 10,000 patients were enrolled costing $250 million. And these trials were based on the fact that let's take all cancer patients who do not respond to standard therapy and see which treatment can benefit them. That's how a common person, common man will benefit. So the biggest problem in medical oncology that almost all drugs we take go into resistance in about six to 10 months, maybe a year and a half. And so we have to understand that how can we overcome the resistance and how can we target those people who are not responding to a standard therapy. So that's the main target. That start the trial on all cancer patients who are not responding to standard therapy. That is the first major trial mission. Second is, let's take one patient, one, one, one tumor, say prostate cancer. And you divide that one type of cancer into different group. As I mentioned earlier, for example, if you have 10 patients and you divide into different group based on their mutation, polymorphism, gene fusion, deletion, amplification. So this way you may have a group of patients who have a common gene profile and then start treating with different drugs. So you might get a drug which can fit on one mutation, not the other ones, and vice versa. So this is what is going on in precision medicine. So again, the purpose is twofold. Number one, again, Dr. Pandari said that if someone has got cancer and he's 
taking treatment and worried about that whether treatment is helping me or not, what should I do? So this is a anxiety, paranoia, and we are all very, very under stress. So for that purpose, we are developing a gene biomarker. So first is, can you accurately diagnose and monitor these patients based on their genetic makeup? That's the main mission. Second is, can you develop treatment that can match their cancer genetic profile? So again, I was mentioning about the drug resistance. Resistance of chemotherapy and other therapy is a huge problem. And United States is spending lots of money on all the trials and hopefully we'll come up with some answer down the line. So there are many, many trials going on. National Clinical Trial Network, National Community Oncology Research Program, Early Detection, NCI MET. All these trials are focusing on two things. One is let's look into the patient who failed to respond. How can we make them respond for drugs? And second, how can we monitor these patients' treatment? They are also using AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning. So this is very exciting and wonderful because machine learning or AI can analyze a huge amount of data. And one paper published this year, 2021, he says that 75% accuracy of AI in a clinical trial. So this means that if you have a trial going on, so this machine learning can tell you whether your trial will be successful or not based on 76% accuracy. So this means doctor has to do a job of 24%, and 76% is done by the machine. This is wonderful. They are using everything possible from every angle they have. This is highly centralized approach. Now, recent study have shown that 35% undiagnosed patient can be diagnosed by using gene testing. So this means 35% patient, they are normal histologically, biochemically, clinically, with CT, MRI, PET scan, whatever what you do, still they are normal. But if you look at their gene profile, they have a cancer. So this means that genetic testing will definitely revolutionize the field and helping the patient significantly. And then based on their huge amount of data, they found that one in five patients which are newly diagnosed, they have different sets of genes. This is really great. And again, I was telling you that common men will be benefited by the fact that if they have a mutation, so they are dividing cancer into different group based on BRCA1, BRCA2, you know, P53, KRAS, P10, ER, ER, whatever these genes are. So if you have mutations of these genes, then they are developing drug, which are mutation specific drug. So that will help the patient who are not responding standard therapy. Similarly, methylation or activation or silencing of different drugs. Okay, those who are patient, I'm gonna educate you about this field of genetics how they started and where we are and where we're going. Okay. The first human genome project was started in 1990, 31 years ago, at 20 different centers all over the world. It took us 13 years, finished in 2003, and cost $100 million. So purpose was that 
can you sequence the whole human body genome to identify all the genes location and function where these genes are located what the function of these genes the result they found that our human body has 6 billion bases of the dna this means 3 billion bases means 6 billion bases and they are on chromosomes and 25000 protein coding genes that's what we found today same project or analysis can be done in one week and cost you $1,000. So this is amazing. You can imagine that how human genome project is skyrocketing. Field has really evolved. It's absolutely mind blowing, staggering, and it's great, it's exciting. Some company like Alumina claim that in the next five years, they can do the whole genome project for $100. So future is very bright and it's very, very exciting. Those who have cancer related mortalities and problems and, and they're suffering, my heart goes to them and I'm sorry about about this deadly disease in the whole world. According to cancer statistics, 15 million patients are newly diagnosed. 8 million men, 7 million women in the world. But this number is underestimated because 5% population of the world has cancer. This means we have a total population of about 7.8 billion people and 5% of that comes out to be 40 million newly diagnosed cancer per year. And this number will be doubled by 2030 if not controlled. The reason I'm saying all that, at the time of diagnosis, 50% surgeries that are done may not be required because they are being misdiagnosed. My brother-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon. I ask him that if you have a cancer, what are you gonna do? Take it out. Even though it may, be, it may not be required. I'll give you an example. If you have a slow growing tumor, and if you don't take it out, you are as good as surgery, even better because you have no surgery, no incontinence, no importance, no surgical related com complications, you are okay. So in my opinion that we, this, this genetic testing can really assure the surgeons or medical oncologists or radiation oncologists that do you really have to go for watchful waiting or go for surgery? So that's the biggest benefit of these gene testing for the common man. I'm answering these two questions again and again because Dr. Bhandari has hit the nail on the head telling me the problem of the patient and I'm addressing those two concerns over and over and over again. Okay, now let me come back on this one. What is genetic testing and, and what gene you look into? You have 25,000 genes. You can't look into those all the genes. And you have got 60,000 known coding genes called microRNA, link RNA, which are recently been discovered. And so you're like almost 100,000 genes in the body. So how can you do a genetic testing for all of that? Okay, let me come back on this one. So if you look at the discovery of a gene that causes cancer, this is focused to the patient, not to the doctors. So the discovery of gene causing cancer is called oncogene. And a gene that suppresses cancer called tumor suppressor gene. So the discovery of oncogene and tumor suppressor gene led to a Nobel Prize 
in 1989 by Michael Bishop and Horner Warmus at my institute at UCSF. I joined UCSF in 1987. Nobel Prize came from a different lab in 1989. So I was there. Then how these genes are being silenced or regulated or inhibited, that led to one more Nobel Prize in 2006 by Andrew Fire from Stanford and Dr. Mello from UMass. So I'm trying to give you all these numbers because I'm trying to tell you what genes to look for for cancer diagnosis and monitoring. That's the purpose of my discussion. If you go back to literature, even the patient can go to a national medical library online, which is free to all of us. And if you type the word cancer and gene, you will find almost 700,000 publications. And if you type different genes, you'll say oncogene and cancer, 300,000. Tumor suppressor gene and cancer, 100,000. DNA methylation and cancer, 40,000. Known coding RNA and cancer, almost 100,000. So all these numbers clearly shows that these oncogene, tumor suppressor gene, all of these genes are the driver. They play a very, very important role. Okay. Now, again, my question was that even if you look into the published data gene, still you have got hundreds and thousands of genes. So how are you going to analyze this puzzle? This is the biggest jeopardy, the puzzle, the biggest problem we have. And we, in my lab, try to solve it. What we did, we, based on published data, we analyze oncogene, tumor suppressor gene, microRNA, link RNA, and make a list, which are the most commonly published genes, say in prostate cancer, I'll give you an example. Then we screen all these genes together in one complex. So I got 100 genes, combining oncogene, tumor suppressor gene, microRNA, link RNA, these are just the name of the gene. And say, okay, I have got 100 of them. We analyze all 100 into our own surgical specimens. Say about 100 or 500 of them. And since these patients were diagnosed about 30 years ago, so almost most of them died. So we know which patients survived for how long and what treatment they went through. So we already know the outcome. So can you follow up? And then we generate a multi-gene algorithm and we correlated those genes with the patient clinical stage and grade and outcome. And we make up a, we come up with a mathematical model. So with like 20 genes out of hundreds of genes. So this is what we did. And so I have been working in the field of cancer research for the last 38 years, published more than 400 papers. And after getting all this data, we filed a patent. And last year, we got the patent issued. Our patent is that multi-gene based testing to avoid surgery, issued in October 13, 2020. Inventors myself and Dr. Alan Northrup. Second pattern is a method of multivariant molecular analysis. And so this pattern was issued on November 3rd, 2020. Inventors are myself and Dr. Alan Northrup. So this pattern covers all important genes which have been tested in our lab and found to be a very important biomarker. And so these set of genes can be used for both for diagnosis, for prognosis, and for monitoring the therapy. 
And this is covering almost all cancers, prostate, kidney, bladder, lung, breast, colorectal, liver, pancreas, gastric, brain, oral, endometrium, and ovarian cancer. So this is very exciting. So this technology, which we have developed in our lab, can be used for all the questions we Dr. Bhandari asked me. Number one, if you look into the blood in screening method, and if you find these genes circulating in the blood, you may have a cancer. Even though your clinical, biochemical, and pathological findings are normal. That's number one. Number two, it can identify whether the tumor is aggressive or slow growing. So this means if you take a biopsy or surgical specimen and you look into the gene profile into that surgical specimen, and if the gene are aggressive gene, means you have a high oncogene, low tumor suppressor gene, and you have high um, link RNA, micro RNA. So this means tumor has all aggressive genes to begin with, therefore need aggressive treatment, surgery, chemo, radiation, combination, whatnot. But if that tumor is a slow growing, this means they have oncogene, low oncogene, high tumor suppressor, but still have a cancer, that patient can be on active surveillance not for surgery and chances are the outcome will be even better than surgery because there is no surgical manipulation. Third thing is after prostatectomy, after surgery, we can do the same thing. We can look into a gene profile. And if gene profile looks aggressive, then this patient can need a aggressive intervention. The last part which Dr. Bhandari was talking about that how do you know that your chemo is working? We don't know. But if we look at this gene testing in the blood, and if cancer cells are dying, then these oncogenes should not be present. So you can monitor that. Even 75, 80% of immunotherapy, which is the most promising we have right now, is not responding. Same is chemo. So I think it's very important to have a monitoring system where you can assess whether my medication is working or not. And the last part is that looking into this genetic makeup can tell you personalized medicine and target therapy. There are many companies in USA who are doing similar tests that I'm talking about. One company is called Prolaris. And now these tests are not for all cancer, mainly for prostate, maybe breast cancer. They, I haven't seen any tests for liver, lung, pancreas, brain, head and neck. I haven't seen those yet. But these two I know, I'll give example, ProRes. ProLaris has a 31 gene. Those genes are cell cycle gene. They're not oncogene causing cancer, they're not. The cipher has 22 genes. Cell cycle gene, cell proliferation, migration, androgen signaling. Come from MDX, this is a different company. They have a three gene, they are tumor suppressor gene, not the oncogene. They have a company called Oncotype DX, Genomic Health. They have 17 genes. They don't tell you what they are. There's a company called Exosome Diagnostic. They have one gene. It's called non-coding RNA. And likewise, we have MDX Select, which is three genes, cell size, cell proliferation, and the PSA testing company. So, 
based on all these tests from these company, they are not combining oncogene, tumor suppressor gene, microRNA, link RNA, like we have done and we got patterned. So I'm trying to tell you that we have got a great hope on precision medicines and helping patients down the line. And I, as I mentioned that all of these genes can be used for different cancers. Now the, the interesting or, or the, the most um, troubling part or not the troubling, I would say this is the most uh, exciting part is that we each cancer is unique and they have a unique set of genes. So therefore one gene test cannot be used for all cancer. They all are different because they have different etiology, different pathology, different progression and metastasis. As I mentioned earlier that we got a pattern in November 2020. In January 2021, I gave a talk about genetic testing at Tata Memorial Cancer Center with Dr. Rajinder Bardwe and Dr. Ganesh Bakshi. Then I gave a talk at Fortis Hospital Max Hospital, PGI Lucknow, Sanjay Gandhi. We gave a lecture at Rajiv Gandhi. We lecture at PGI Chandigarh, my parent institute. We gave a lecture at HCZ Cancer. We lecture at Amrita Hospital. We gave a lecture at Rajiv Gandhi. Apollo Hospital, then at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, and Henry Ford with Dr. Mani Manon, and then lecture at different other universities, Osaka, Kagoshima, Yamaguchi, all of these different places. Now, during my lectures, there were several concerns and questions we've asked and, and were very disturbing to me that first of all, all these company I mentioned, they charge $4,000 per test. They're close to 2.8 lakhs rupees. It takes four to six weeks. So 99% of Indian patients cannot afford this test. So we must fix it. And these companies, as I mentioned, they do not sell kit. They only provide service. You ship your samples to this company. They do all the testing and send your data. So we don't know what they analyze. And we don't know what they do. They get your data. So I had a long discussion with different hospitals and they all told me that, especially in Tata Memorial, that 40% patient in India at the time of diagnosis are already metastasized. This means we don't have a test. Number two, that these companies who are doing the test, the results are very disturbing. And almost all the samples they sent to this company, result came out to be, oh, this tumor is a slow growing tumor. And the patient died in two to three years. So my concern was that number one, when most patients are metastatic in the beginning. So this means tumors are aggressive to begin with. Number two, after spending $4,000, your results are slow growing tumors and the patient died. 
to me doesn't make sense. And that must be fixed. We have decided that we can transfer our technology to India for free, no charge. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to set up a this genetic center or testing center at all 28 states and eight UT in India. Oh, there are some questions coming. I'll be happy to stop and I'll take questions because my purpose is to make you educated, as Dr. Bandari said, not just give it all. Question, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daya, for a wonderful uh, public understanding subject. It really clarified a lot of doubts. Uh, now, question is that I have a question because I didn't hear your talk. I, I should have been there, but somehow the other, I had another webinar when Mani told me that you are talking in, the, in a common round between Mount Sinai and Henry Ford. Uh, my question is, uh, what is, have you validated your uh, um, uh, gene arrays? on fresh patients or Answer it is, is no. the history. Yeah, it is, it is the historic, yes. historical data. Historical data. Historical data. Yes, sir. And the, the, this is your, um, uh, the, the registry which Peter Carroll used to manage is the same patient volume or different? It's a different. He's at the VA San Francisco hospital. Okay, VA San Francisco. Yeah. Right, right. And how many patients were there in cancer prostate? 5,500. 500. 500. And uh, uh, see, because our problem is mainly in early stage prostate cancer. We are talking of Gleason 6 and 7. Okay. And that's where the over treatment is, as you know. Absolutely. And that's where its value would be very high. Have a decipher or anything, because Firaz is using decipher here, has been published anywhere? Decipher outcomes? No, sir, because. We just got patterned in November mm. last year. And yeah. so this is what we can do together. I had uh, been in touch with sometime Carlos at Colombia. Is he still in Colombia? He also had a product, isn't it? So, yeah. Cordo. Carlo Croci. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. Carlo Croci. I know him. Yeah. So he also had a similar uh, product a long time ago, I, five years ago, he was talking about this stuff. Wonderful, thank you very much. Are there any questions? My name is Rimsha. I have a question. My question is that personalized medicine is useful for all kinds of cancer. I think you've answered that question partly. Um, but uh, what cancer you said is prostate uh, uh, is one and uh, ovarian cancer is another? Uh, we have about 14 different cancers. So the answer is yes, it will be used for all cancers. Ultimately, it would be used for all cancers, yes. Uh, uh, where do you see the role? I'm adding a question. Where do you see the role of uh, uh, AI in new drug development? Well, the AI in machine learning is a wonderful computerized or mega, or mega data, you know, like the large data analysis. When you have got billions and billions of DNA bases and you have million, hundreds of millions of polymorphism or mutations or whatnot. So machine learning can really help us out to track down which is more important. And there is a theoretical deduction I have is that as I see out of 10,000 molecules tried, one molecule comes as a successful drug. Now, it is a huge pharmaceutical industry. It really invests huge amount of money to do that. And takes years and years before you really get to the clinical trial to satisfy FDA clearance and make sense. Don't you think that AI would shorten the route and you can simulate the whole thing uh, with the data only? Well, in, in 2021, I mentioned earlier that there was a trial on 
phase three prostate cancer, and AI could predict 76% accuracy of the outcome of the, of the, of the, of the trial. Mm -hmm. And so your point is well taken. People are using AI for data analysis, and there'll be a huge benefit to solving or cut down the, the course of time. Yeah, and because... US government has already spent more than $1 billion on these trials. Oh, in the last oh, two oh. years. Right, right. Trial started in 2018. It's right. like two and a half years now. Right. So it's a huge undertaking and it's gonna benefit a lot of patients in all different directions. There are questions really similarly, and Dr. Bilal has another question. Please write to Vatikuti Foundation. We will try to help you out because it's not possible for Dr. Daya to tell whether there are employment opportunities or not. And we have a network of people and we'll try to help, but write to Vatikuti Foundation if you have any questions about your career prospects or you need any advice, because we do that counsel. Uh, now, last word from you, Dr. Daya, what would you advise the, a patient who has a cancer prostate and uh, early cancer prostate? What would be your practical advice to him? My advice is that they should look into the gene profile mm -hmm. in their either biopsies or whatever specimens they got. Yeah. And see if those gene profiles are low, low cancer or high cancer, if they have high oncogene, low tumor suppressor gene, or vice versa, that can predict the aggressive behavior of the tumor. So this is the most important part. Can you predict the aggressiveness? Based and then, these. yeah, then they can probably choose between active surveillance or surgery, depending on whatever it is. Totally, it? absolutely. That was my point, sir. Okay, thank you. Can I move ahead? Can I carry on? Yeah, yeah, please, 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 okay. please. So, so my purpose is that whatever USA patent technology we have now, we want to take this technology to, especially in India, all states, 28 states and eight UT. So maybe we can set up a center all places. So this means all the kits will be manufactured in the USA. They will be sent to different testing center in India. And each center can be an independent center in their own operation. And you can do this testing in one week. And yeah. this is on your own. So what we can do, whatever is manufacturing cost of making these chemicals, we will ship it to you. Right. It's a non-profit non group that we are going to take whatever it costs us to do it, but this is gonna be a free from our side to you. Right. And we want to have this set up, this center set up all over, all over India. There is a question that uh, affordability of test you had addressed, I think, somewhere $1,000, but it's truly, is it in the United States, $1,000 for the thing? And insurance doesn't cover it, is it? $4,000 is, is being charged by this company in USA. Okay. $4,000. But and it is, uh, is out of pocket, completely out of pocket. Yeah, I said 99% people cannot afford it. So right. our, if we make, ask this company, make these, these tests, the chemical cost will be maybe less than $100. Yeah. yeah. So these, these are like manufacturing of these genes by using this high-tech machine. So it's the cost we pay to this company to make it. I have one more question, Dr. Daya, that, uh... Now, I saw in your profile that you have an experience in epigenetics also. Correct. And I have a very specific interest in environmental impact on genes, as well as on, uh, as a transplant surgeon, I always looked into immune reconstitution. So what is your take that you have a particular gene profile? How often you expect it to change because of environmental stimulus or they don't change or what you're thinking on that? This is a very exciting area of research and is a high priority 
during uh, President Obama time, we call them health disparity based on environmental factor. So environmental, socioeconomic, and health disparity. I'll give you an example. African American living in Africa, they have a very low incidence of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So when they migrate to Europe or USA, they have the highest incidence, higher than Caucasian. Okay. So this is a well-known fact. There are a lot of publication on it. And my lab was the first one in 2006. We published that there are certain set of genes which are, method, which are epi, genetically altered by DNA methylation, and they are differentially methylated in African-American Caucasian. So if you want to know why some transplant patients respond, why other ones not, I will go into more of their T cell, B cell repertoire, mm -hmm. immune profiling. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you exactly who does it. And you can collaborate with them because this is more of a immune response rejection rather than DNA methylation based epigenetics. So yeah. our mission is to transfer this technology of precision medicine and gene testing to India, and they will help on other countries. You know, we are open to all of all the countries. And as I mentioned that this field is evolving and is a long way to go, and US government has spent billions here. So it's just the beginning of the new era and new treatment and new management for precision medicine, and we must take care of it. And so we need some collaborator who really want to set up these laboratories if they have interest. You know, this is gonna be wonderful for all of us. So it'll be a total transformation of technology from here, from USA to your countries, whatever country you wanna go for. It's gonna be, because we don't want, because first of all, these companies, they do not sell any kit and they're charging $4,000. So they made everybody impossible to get these tests done. So we are using a better technology, God just got patented. I mean, not patented, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah patented. So, and take it to your home country and your place and you set up your own hospital. And we will teach you over the webinar how to do it. It's pretty simple. Let me come back into a more exciting area of gene-based testing. So my lab was the first one who discovered how to activate mRNA. And we know about messenger RNA because COVID-19 vaccines, everyone know about it, they are all mRNA-based. And we give this name called RNA activation. And so if this double strand RNA, the trigger RNA activation, we give the name called small activating RNA. So we published this paper in 2006 in PNAS, then published in Nature, and then in, in Science. And if you do a Wikipedia RNA activation or small activating RNA is the discovery made in our laboratory and we have patented on it. So based on our discovery, US-based company called Mina Therapeutic, they started a trial on metastatic liver cancer patient using small activating RNA. And they got some very promising data. And they raised $268 million for this project. So this means that this RNA activation project has a great future. So our mission is, can we use this set of gene both for diagnosis as well as for treatment? For example, if you have these five genes, they are causing cancer, we can use them as a diagnostic gene. Now we come back and inhibit all the five genes 
through siRNA or some inhibitors, there'll be a treatment strategy. So this is our dream project and we should make it happen. As Dr. Bhandari mentioned that we have published like more than 400 papers in all very high impact journals. And I have a team of like 24 MD PhDs who have been doing a wonderful job from a surgeon to medical oncologist to biochemist to microbiologist. And all of them can understand the problems. And we came up with this wonderful, wonderful product and the ideas, which is really great for precision medicines and going to help all these patients. Those who are interested in contacting me, my name is Rajveer Dahia. You can reach me at rdahia at gmail.com. And I have my WhatsApp number and cell phone number. And that's where I work in San Francisco. And this is UCSF. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. I'm grateful to you. And I'm open for discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Daya. And uh, I once again thank you for this illuminating talk. And uh, it's not the last one. We'll come back to you. And uh, really, we appreciate your thing. Thank you very much, everybody from Vatikuti Foundation and Dr. Daya. And uh, good morning again. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.